and gentlemen, welcome to Spin TV. And we have Mr. Justin Mott, uh, the Amor Americano, uh, who stays in Hanoi right now. Okay, let me tell you who is Justin Mott. Uh, if you guys watch about, uh, is, is, was, was it a shoot off or <laughs> I forgot what it was there. There was some sort of uh, uh, um, uh, TV shows about participants and then they are being pitted with each other on shows and then oh. Justin was one of the participants. <laughs> That, that was that one was sponsored by Canon, if I'm not wrong as well. So and, and he he participated it in and as a participant all over Asia, uh, Southeast Asia. And then when he came to Singapore, that's because I'm a media. I got invited by Canon people to actually um, talk to Justin about the show and blah 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 and and generate some interest in it. And um, people got to know him because of the show. And then Singaporeans actually know him and Malaysians and I think Indonesians as well when he was one of the judges for the Canon Photo Marathon. So, uh, Justin, just say hi to everybody. Just give a short introduction. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Yeah, so I was, the, I was the face and host of Photo Face Off on History Channel for photo five years. Photo Face Off, Photo Face Off. <laughs> I, I've been a professional photographer for over... For about 15 years, I started my career in documentary and as a photojournalist covering uh, assignments in the New York Times. I've mm -hmm. done over 100 assignments in the New York Times all around, all around Southeast Asia. Uh, the TV show, Photo Face Up, was sponsored by Canon. I've judged about, I don't know now, in, in between Thailand, Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, Philippines, Singapore. I've been missing other places. I've judged over 20-something Canon photo marathons. Well, that's uh, a lot. I've done, I run a production company as well, Mott Visuals, where I do, we do commercial photography and video production for you know, a lot of luxury hotels. Our biggest and most renowned client would be Intercontinental Hotels. I've probably shot over 30 hotels for them. So I do a bunch of stuff with my photography, a lot of stuff with video photography and with video, a lot of stuff with commercial photography. But my background is in journalism and documentary photography. And I'm currently working on a long-term book project called Kindred Guardians, where I photograph people around the world who dedicate their lives to helping animals. And that story has been featured in the Washington Post and in Paris Match and in uh, Greenpeace Magazine. So I do assignments, I do commercial work, and I run a YouTube channel now as well, which is uh, youtube.com slash askmot, where I review gear and just sort of give insight into my life as a professional photographer. I'm currently working on a long-term book project called Kindred Guardians, where I photograph people around the world who dedicate their lives to helping animals. And that's... Hmm, hmm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was like trying to to do the invite link for for more people to come in, All right. uh, and then somehow rather that that thing pops out and then oh whoa, whoa, how come I'm here double of you? It's some comments, so I see I see Stella said hello and and Jimmy. Said hi hello. Stella, hi Jimmy. Yeah, okay. yeah. So I have to take care of that too now. I wish I have I have assistance for this. It, it's actually a good thing about assistant. Um, when you're doing live, so that at least you let somebody, uh, just somebody is asking question, right? Now. <laughs> and then, uh, oh, okay, okay, <laughs> we can quickly get things done. Um, oh, okay. So that's how I meet Justin. It's like through all these things uh, that he's doing, and because he he is in Hanoi. And Hanoi is one of the places I went to visit as well. So it's like, yeah, I got motivation to know him then. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, but as fate had has it, it's like now I'm more involved with uh in down central Hue, uh because of, of some connections down there uh, when it comes to tourism and travel. But ho hopefully we'll take a train up and then I go and find him as well and and go and visit his loft, which is beautiful. Oh my god! Every time I look at his place, it's like <laughs> it's a freaking mini studio. Come on, that's not a place to stay. That is a freaking studio. It's so nice. I, I will do a lot of people. It's funny. I talk about photography on my YouTube channel, but most people ask me questions about they want to see my house. So I'm gonna that's show. That's right. It. I designed it all myself and rented it for many years and recently purchased it. So I will do like a full on. Once I get my gimbal, <laughs> I will do a full on like cinematic cool tour of my place. So I think that'll be fun. <laughs> oh, oh, David just came. And David Teo it's uh, also one of my friends. Uh, he's the leader of, of the Leica, the Leica group in Singapore. So I'm not so sure if, hey, Dick, if David wants to come in, you can come in and just say hi. And then you can share this, this, uh, this channel oh, with, with hi, David, the people I Leica as well. Thank you for following David. <laughs> no. 
Hey, this is gonna be fun. This is gonna be fun. I, I can oh, sense the funny coming in. Maybe chill it. Uh, yeah. I lost your uh, video feed there. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, I can see you. Oops. That's the problem with GoPro. <laughs> it's really that is so the your house, problem Jimmy, with GoPro. You know what, Jimmy? I would, but right now I would have to. I'm I'm doing this Zoom call on a desktop on an iMac, so it would be really hard to carry that around, and I don't have a long enough plug. But uh, I will do a tour soon on my YouTube channel of my entire house. It'll be fun because, like I said, I designed it myself because I shoot a lot of architecture, shoot a lot of like luxury hotels. So I got a lot of ideas. I learned a lot of things. So I kind of pieced it together myself. And it's very affordable because labor in Vietnam is, is quite cheap and so are materials. So, uh, yeah, I was very, really proud and did it at a, a very affordable price. It's been a lot of fun to build my house. Yeah. Actually, I'm inviting to try to come into a Zoom conversation. I already gave you guys the link. So do come in. So we can have a lively discussion. So let's go to the let's go to the the, 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 the thing about about gears. Um, because Justin just actually he didn't do one; he did two videos on about gears, and just want to understand what is the motivation of you. What the what is what is the motivation for you to do those things? Is it because somebody's keep hounding you? Ah, I'm gonna buy this. I'm gonna buy that. Do you think it's good for me? Is is that is that the motivation for for doing the video? You know, a couple things. So during COVID and, and we're not completely locked down here in Vietnam, we've been, we've been open but to travel domestically, but most of my work is outside of Vietnam. So I've been sort of inside. So I decided to launch a YouTube channel, something I've wanted to do for a long time. And I thought it'd be fun to, as part of that, to talk about gear. But I see a lot of people online do great gear reviews like yourself. Mm -hmm. People do gear reviews and they try different things. That's not really what I'm going to do because I'm a working professional photographer doing a lot of shoots. I wanted to just kind of talk about the gear that I use and why, because people like to, people like to know, like, what do you use as a professional photographer? Mm -hmm, and I use mm -hmm. different kits for different things. Mm -hmm, and I do mm -hmm. have some sponsors. I do work with Think Tank bags. I do work with Wotencraft bags, but my relationship with them is great. Like I've worked with them for years. They've never actually even asked me to do a review. They just give me stuff and ask for feedback and they never give me any stipulations on it. But recently I thought, well, why not use a review? I mean, why not do a review? Because I have worked with their stuff with you. I have used their equipment for years. I thought, why not just sort of show why I use it and the things that I like about it and things that I don't like about it. So it's been fun kind of to sit back and, and, and reflect on the gear that I use and why I use it and actually talk about it. And then last year, you know, I've been doing a lot with the Leica reviews because last year I made a big switch in my career. I started my personal project, Ninja Guardians. I looked for a new kit, something lighter, something more minimal, minimalistic, something that kind of get back to my roots, which is just kind of one camera, one lens. I, I sometimes mm -hmm. use a little bit more than that. So I did make a switch to the Leica M10D. I, I took it actually about a year ago. I Leica Singapore let me borrow it for about a day. I took it out. I fell in love with it. I really liked their approach too. They were kind of like, before you buy this camera system, because the Leica M10D is it's a it's a digital camera, a very expensive digital camera, as you know, about eight thousand dollars without a screen. But the lady there that I worked with at the time in marketing, she's like, she wasn't like a pushy salesperson. She's like, try it out, and and I'm the one that went to her. She's like, try it before you, because you need to really make sure that this works for you. And I tried it for a day there, and I got a great feel for it. And I used to use an M6, so I, I knew the feel, but I really enjoyed the process. I enjoyed the experience, and I thought, mm -hmm. why not talk about stuff like at a lot of people do quick reviews. Like I use this for a weekend and, and this is why I like it. Or I pick this up for the day and here are the specs. And, I, and there, is a, there is a market for that. There's a lot of people that do that. There's a lot of people do that well. But for me, it was like, listen, I've used this camera for a year or I've used this bag for two years. Let me talk about why. Because you really know deeply. And I've used it in professional circumstances, which I also think can relate to amateurs or even just like people that shoot in the weekend. So mm -hmm. it's just trying to give a, a fresh or different perspective on stuff from someone that uses it in a different way. Mm -mm. I, I use a Fuji X100, and although it's not um, a manual focusing system like you have, you would have on the Leica system, mm -hmm. but um, the feel it's about eighty to ninety percent. It is, and, yeah. Yeah, the the Fuji Film X100. I'm I I will say the feature. <laughs> it's a very. Uh, I'm trying to find the right word so I don't get into trouble with Fuji Film. <laughs> it's it's uh, when we were first started, it was a problematic autofocus system to the point whereby it's as good as a manual focus. And in that way, it actually forces you into, into the process of photography that you had to do a manual focusing, that you have to think about your composition. It's, in other words, it slows you down. I think, I think part of the a personal project is to actually get you to think, get you to be involved, get you to, to look beyond just the aesthetics, but how do you bring the aesthetic out to tell a story like like your project like like uh, like the animals like 
um, you, you feel for the people who are actually protecting those animals. I think that's the, that's the main part of it all. Um, but Lycas are basically not known for ruggedness, I guess, especially when it comes to digital. Don't you think so? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a good, good question. And, and, and first of all, I should also put out there too, people think that I like, am sponsored by Leica, but I'm not. I actually, they have featured my work quite a bit, but yes. I, the way I always operate is I use gear first and gear that I like, and then I will have a discussion with people like with these companies. So I've always used it, or I've, I never like take gear and say, okay, now I'll sponsor, like, sponsor me and then I'll use your gear. It's more, I've used your gear for a certain amount of time and then, and, you know, and, and, then, and then let's have a relationship, but make sure yeah. I like it first because I want it to be very genuine. But I do put gear to the test. I will say, you know, a lot of, I will, I will say a couple things about bugs and about reliability. When I use my, my Canon 5D system, I use the Canon 5D Mark I, Mark II, and Mark III throughout my entire career, and Mark IV. Uh, so I use, I use, I even use the 1DX uh, Mark I and Mark II at different points in my career for different things. And I never had any problems with the Canon. So I will say that it's been 100% like on it from the beginning. I think a bigger company, bigger budget, and bigger marketing, you know, or, or research and development kind of budget. So yeah, I never had any issues with that. The Leica N10D, the only bug I've really had with it in the beginning was there was an issue with the memory card. I would say the feel of it is rugged because it's metal. I'm not dropping it a lot, but it does fit nice in your hands. Um, you I want to wear, draw a ten thousand dollars. <laughs> I don't, but I do. I, I don't treat my like. There's different kinds of Leica users. There's Leica yeah. users that buy things as a collectible and like the like just the prestige of having a Leica. But like mm -hmm. I, it's, mm -hmm. I use my camera. Like I really use it. Like it's on the ground. It's you know it's in dirt things like that. Now, mm -hmm. I haven't got, like completely want like drenched. I'm careful with situations like that. But I will get nicks on my camera. I'm okay with that. I'm not precious about it. So the Leica has held up overall in the beginning the m10d because it is such a niche camera it did have a memory card problem that was weird and it was one of those problems because it's such a cam it's a camera that not many people use that no one knew how to fix it i had to figure it out for myself like i talked to like the people i went on threads and no one knew how to fix it so basically if you bought if you had a memory card and you used it on a sony and then switched it over to a leica right. even if you formatted it within the leica it wouldn't work I yeah, like, oh. yeah, yeah. I, borrowed a, I borrowed a leica q1 uh and then i said okay i'll just format it in the q1 and then try it that didn't work so the only way it worked is if you actually formatted this memory card, if you used it in another system, and then yeah. over, you had to like you had to either do like a deep format using software on your on your um, computer, or you had to you had to format in another like a uh, M system, so like an M10 or an yeah. M10P. So that was kind of weird and that was odd. So my workaround with that was to say, okay, I'm just gonna have dedicated cards for that. And now I also have I have dedicated cards to my Leica, and that's it. So yeah, that was a little bit of a pain. That was annoying that an eight thousand dollar camera I couldn't even format it. Even when I'm using the the app that they that you can buy, like I think you have to buy the app now. I think which is kind of annoying as well. But you know, overall, I, I, it's probably not as reliable as as the Canon has been because hmm. it is a smaller camera. But overall, like it does have a rugged feel to it. But I, I would say you're you're probably right and accurate in that. that they could use some improvements on on reliability, but. Overall, mine's, mine's performed in the way I wanted to perform just besides that one hiccup with the, with the memory card. Mm -hmm. I, I, first thing first, welcome, David. Can you switch on the mic? <laughs> Hello. Can you guys hear me? Hi, David. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, hi. 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 Good to see you, Justin. <laughs> Look at that. Okay, let's share. What do you got on this webcam there? I'm, I'm, using a, I'm, I'm using a mirrorless camera as my webcam, yeah. There you go. That's the, there you go. That's the reason why we next, won. I will do that next with my recently purchased A6600. Damn it. I'm going yes, to that will, that will work quite well. Yeah. We'll, anyway. go, we'll, we'll get into Sony. I will get into Sony. We'll definitely get into Sony because um, why we are doing this? Because because the last two months, two, three months, we're seeing a lot, lot of brands coming up, the new cameras and all, sure. all the stuff. And I think it's high time for us to really, really look into all these things and say, what the F is going on? Uh, what is our focus right now? What are we going to do uh, from the user perspective? Like, like me, it's like, yeah, I definitely get, must get something better. Yes, thank you, Jimmy, for talking about asking me to buy a Razer camera, another camera when <laughs> <laughs> I need mula, I need mula. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I, I actually put, put a note down there about nicer glass because in, in Justin's uh, video is about nicer glass and Leica has very nice glass. Sure. Glasses that will cost you a kidney and, <laughs> and yeah. liver just to buy it sometimes. Yeah. 
Yeah. Can you hear me? I hope yeah. you can hear me. Yeah. And 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 what do you really mean by nicer glass? I'm that's a of course it's a very subjective thing. Like um, what do you what, what how are you gonna use a nicer glass? Yeah. What do you mean by nice glass? Well, I have my know, definition of nice glass. I'm <laughs> saying, so, definition of nice glass. So like the, you know, the basis of this was like you mentioned, Wilson. I just recently did a blog about what you should like how to buy your next camera or your first right. camera. Right. And I think I think it's important because when you do those vlogs or you do those little like blogs or vlogs, whatever you're doing, people expect like a clear answer, but it's so many variables and so different for, for so many people. So so what I wanted to think what I wanted to talk to people about was just giving general advice about you know, before you make that purchase, let's think. And one of those things was, well, you know, invest in nice glass, invest in better lenses because cameras, they're changing them every year. Some of these companies, some of the models are changing, you know, every other year, some of them are changing, yeah, every five years, but some are changing like way too quickly and cameras lose their value so quickly. So, but lenses don't like for me, when I buy like the lenses, my 35 1.4 will probably hold its value for another I don't know, 10 years, it might even be more expensive later on. But the thing is, with a manual focus lens like, like a Leica 3514, I'm not going to have to like change that glass. So I'm not going to have to buy like six different versions of that in 10 years. That's a one-time investment. So mm -hmm. while it's expensive, that's it. And I also always invested in nicer glass for every system that I've used. So I use, when I use Canon, and I still use Canon for some stuff. So when I use a Canon 5D, I always bought L-series lenses and I bought prime lenses. So, you know, nicer glass, meaning like it could shoot at 1.4, they're L-series lenses. You get less chromatic aberration, but more, I would always invest in nicer glass for a, for a better aperture because I like to shoot wide open and I like to shoot in low light situations. And I like those capabilities. I always found the L-series lenses, like I use the 35 1.4 on the Canon system quite a bit. I love the pop that I have. It has a noticeable difference for me. And again, I'm getting paid for my work and I'm getting paid to do these kind of assignments, both commercial and editorial. So it's worth it for me. Everyone has to make that decision for themselves. But to me, you know, buying, uh, investing in tens of thousands of dollars in lenses for a system, it's, it's not a problem because I'm going to be using this quite a bit and I'm going to be using it professionally. Now your average person, one, if you can't see the difference or, and if you can't afford it, then it's probably not the right lens for you. If you're not making money off of it, Mm. and you can't afford it, then definitely don't do it. But, you know, everyone has to make that decision for themselves. But I always feel like glass is a one-time investment. When I started my career, I shot my first entire year of assignments for New York Times all over Southeast Asia with a Canon original 5D and the old Canon 35 1.4. And I used just oh, that really lens nice. for an entire year. And that lens I used for another six or seven years after that before, oh, maybe even longer than that. So they came out, I used it all the way up until they came out with the newer 35 1.4. And even that was just like a... It was an update, but it, I really didn't necessarily even need it. That class would last me such a long time. I can't say the same thing about camera bodies. They're always changing and always have a bunch of new features. And that's also what drew me to the Leica is no features, no upgrades. So an $8,000 camera seems expensive, but if I'm not buying another camera for another 10 years, it's not that expensive. It's, it's also not that easy to upgrade a Leica. <laughs> and it's also not that easy to upgrade a Leica every year. Right, yeah. Only yeah, because of the cost, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, you're right. You're not really making a lot of changes. Not and, <laughs> but, and that works for me, but it's, it's all situational, right? It really matters for me. Like, I've learned something like, okay, I can afford to, at this point in my career, at mm -hmm. this point in my life, to have different kits for different things. Like, the, the Leica system, at first, I thought I would just use it for my personal project because my project allows me to slow down. My assignments tend to not be, like, not not be so slow. So if I'm doing an assignment from the New York Times, I might get two days to cover like, and I've got to shoot from sun up to sundown a bunch of different things. So I thought, okay, well, that's not good. I'm not going to be able to slow down like I can with my personal project where I'm going to say, I'm going to follow this lady who takes care of slots and I'm going to spend eight days with her. I have time to anticipate. I have time to think. I have time to let me do the things that the Leica does well, which is to slow down. But once I started using the Leica and got more comfortable with it, I actually started using it for assignments. In January, before the lockdown, I did an assignment for the Smithsonian and I actually left the Canon gear behind. It's something I hadn't done before on like a real assignment. It was a magazine assignment. It was about four days in Myanmar. And I used, I, I didn't just use the M10D because I like to have two bodies when I'm shooting professionally a foreign assignment. So I went with that. I have an M10D and an M10 and I shot the assignment and I, I felt great about it. I was very happy with the results. And now I'm using the Leica system for my assignments as well. So it's mm -hmm. kind of like what, what, what gear works for you, everyone's so different. Everyone has these debates all the time. Like, no, that camera, look, like, I, I try to block all that out. I test it myself. I look at it myself. I understand the basic specs, but I'm very honest with myself about what things I need and what things I don't need. Agree. Mm. So, 
I I was just say one thing about about having the Leica system is you have people who are trading those lenses mm -hmm. and that goes into the second hand market that we are talking about right now yeah. it, it's like why would you buy a camera system and and one of the things that i look into especially right now i'm trying to find a good mirrorless system to go into right now how many do i have i have <laughs> <laughs> i have nikon z z <laughs> now look z z nikon z canon r yep Panasonic L of the Elmo Alliance, <laughs> which is which is also a Leica system, by the way. Also, the Sigma and Leica and uh, and Panasonic, so it's the L system. So I have this tree, and we'll, for Jimmy's sake, we'll talk about Olympus. And <laughs> for people who are coming out uh, coming out of Olympus, what can we do for them, or what what they should think about? I think that is a very good question to have. Yeah. What about Olympus? What's happening with Olympus? What is Panasonic going to do with it? So when I look at all these things, one of the things, of course, the, the, the thing that I want to think about is how good are the camera's performance by itself? And secondly, what kind of lenses that can be matched? And what kind of lenses can I buy in the future? Uh, for, especially from third party. For like us, um, you, do have, you do have third parties. Well, what's the other top up here? I can't forget. It's just and it's Voigtlander. There's like uh, uh, the Voigtlanders. Yeah, well. The Voigtlanders are great lenses too. Um, and and to be honest, uh, a lot of people who did not buy Leica lenses but actually got the Voigtlanders are are, are very happy with the, with them as well for a particular look that they like. And I have to agree with them. I kind of like the Voigtlanders over the Leica. Leica is a bit too precise sometimes. It's too clean. Put it that way. But it's a subjective, subjective matter. So, from do you think that if you, from the Leica point of view, or from uh, 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 now it, since you really just got a Sony, what what makes you think about the Sony over the other mirrorless system right now? Is it because it's just cheap or <laughs> it is cheap? The A sixty six hundred is cheap in comparison to it, the L brand. Yeah. <laughs> Look at it that way. So the second-hand market, I'm not so sure about how, where do you buy your second-hand lenses? Uh, our, of course, me and David will share about the Singapore context, but what, in Hanoi, what did you, where do you buy from? For, for second-hand, I actually bought my second-hand, I bought a second-hand like a lens. One I bought at b in h in, in uh, the U.S. when I was back in New York visiting. I bought a 75, an old 75 Tele Elmore, uh, uh, sorry, an old 135. So it was like a few hundred bucks, but it was a great lens. Like I looked at it. I like to buy, for me, it's different. I like to buy used, like, expensive stuff. I like to buy from a larger brand rather than yeah. individual because I like that yeah. I can hold them responsible. Uh, you know? and, and so I don't mind paying a little bit extra. And then in, in Singapore, I did buy a 21, um, I did buy the 21 uh, Super Super Elmar, I think it's called. And it's a great lens. I bought the, the Leica 21 at a secondhand store in Singapore, I forget where it is. It's that like place that has all those little shops with all the Leica stuff. And there was one shop that was like looked really nice. The guy was really cool, and they had like good reviews. I wish I could think of the name of them. Is, right it, now. is it on the first floor? Is it uh, Excelsior Hotel? Open Excelsior Hotel, yeah. And yeah, it's I, know, I, know, I, know. I think David would know it. <laughs> they also sell like Billingham <laughs> bags. Right? Yeah, yeah. They sell Billingham bags, stuff like that. So I bought it there. Like, I'll look at the lens quickly. The, the market in Vietnam for used lenses is not a great market for me to, to sell or buy because, like, people here, th there's two different kinds of Leica users. That's the thing. There's Leica users that really just want everything perfect, and they're almost, like, showcasing it and the prestige of it, but they're not using it. Now, I'm a Leica user, so when, when I go to sell my lenses, people are like, oh, my God, what is this? It's all scratched up. It works fine. Functionally, it's great, but aesthetically it's all it'll be it'll be beat up and i don't keep stuff like now i do just for that sit in case i'm going to sell stuff like here you have to have everything because everyone's afraid in vietnam because the secondhand market is you know people it's worth it for people to strip down parts so anything you buy secondhand people are afraid like oh is that even the original lens hood or is that this they want you to keep everything i don't normally do that but now i do i have to keep the box i have to keep the paperwork yeah, yeah. Vietnam has such a bad reputation for fakes yes you know, that, that people really pay attention to that stuff so okay. It's hard for me to sell my old equipment, but when you do buy stuff here, you can get it pretty pristine. So, like, when I, if I did want to buy secondhand, I can get it, like, but the price is still at a, at a, at a decent amount. So, I, I have a guy that I'll ask, and he works at, like, sort of a camera shop 
area that's similar to like the Excelsior area. And I just kind of talked to him. It's about building trust with an individual. You know, if I buy enough from this one person and I sell enough to him, then we kind of trust each other. And that's kind of our relationship. But when you buy from like an individual small shop, it's more about trust. Like to, if I had a problem with this, is this guy or gal going to take it back? Are they going to be responsible for it? Yeah. That, that's important to me. So I tend to, when I find someone good, I just stick with them and do everything through them. Mm -hmm. that, that's, the th that's the thing about secondhand. And a lot of people just, um, just have a bad rap, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, because of all the bad experiences, especially, I think you heard about carousel. So we call it carousel. hell. It's because everybody is hellish trying to buy and buy and buy something or sell something to somebody who's because they're just trying to, to undercut you. Right. It's a lot of work, a lot of back and forth. I, I, I have uh I have a staff, so when I'm selling stuff, I usually have them deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> you see, that is a difference, man. It's like you have staff. Stuff, S T A F F. We don't have. We have to like <laughs> ourselves. Like, hey, right. depends. some people want to talk to me directly, and that's fine as well. But sometimes it's a language barrier. My Vietnamese oh, yes. is so great, so my staff can can deal with them and talk to them. But mm -hmm. even right now, like I had found selling stuff in Vietnam was so complicated, and people wanted so many things. Like sometimes it's a deal breaker for people to not have like a lens cap. I'm like, what do you care? You can go buy that for two dollars. Deduct yeah. two dollars off of the price. Like it's True. like oh, it's not it's like it's crazy, a crazy, crazy secondhand market here sometimes. So. It's, it's a lot to deal with. So what I did is I tried to set up an eBay account in the U.S. And, but it's really hard if you set up an eBay account in the U.S. and you live overseas. Yeah. Even if you use a VPN, like eBay just shuts you down. So I made the mistake of taking a lot of my old, like I was selling some old Canon gear and some other bags and stuff. And I brought it to the U.S. And my mom, my poor mom, like she actually sells stuff on eBay. She, she makes these little dolls right. and sells them. She had, but it didn't make sense for a lot of people. She's like, what is this lady that sells dolls now selling like a, you know, a, a 5DSR or something like that. So it's, <laughs> but she's now selling it and I answer all the questions for her. That's how we've had to do it. So eBay, I found is a decent way to do it. But I try to, you know, now I just work with it. If, if I'm okay with like taking a little bit less, I work with one of the guys I work with here. Or if I'm looking to trade something like, when I got this A6600, which I yeah. bought purely for video purposes, yeah. purely for vlogging and sort of nice B-roll of stuff that I want to do, these sort of episodes I want to do on YouTube, um, I traded a lot of old gear with this guy. Not a great value, but that's how I worked it out. It was just easier for me than, you know, I probably lost like 15% of what I could have got if I sold everything individually, but, you know, time is money. It would have taken me two months to probably sell everything else individually. Mm -hmm. There are, there, are about, uh, there are quite a few questions when it comes to gears, when, especially when it comes to secondhand. As far as I'm concerned, if I have to agree with you. If, if I'm going to get a secondhand, usually I'll get it from a shop rather than individual, just in case. Um, because we need not know, we do will not know how, uh, how well is the equipment being uh, taken yeah. care of. That's the number one problem with us. Um, especially going to use the secondhand gear for professional work. <laughs> yeah, that is that is something that we have to think about at the back of our minds. You go, will it fail at the wrong time? Yeah, yeah, so, and and will it stop working at the wrong time? And that get gets me into to to this camera called the Canon R six and R five. <laughs> <laughs> what, what have you heard? And you, I think you we, we all know what's the problem that has been saying it out in the internet, the blogger sphere and whatever sphere you're talking about when we talk about R5, R6, it's like, what is Canon thinking? Um, so we have this camera, uh, for those people who do not know that, uh, the Canon R5, R6 is the, I would say the third generation or the third iteration of their mirrorless system called the R system. And um, they came out with the R, they came out with the RP. Both, uh, one is a, semi-professional level camera one it's a uh, entry level full frame mirrorless system and right now the r5 r6 is supposed to be the professional level mm -hmm. um since justin is actually working on video as well as still photography right now is is canon's um strategy of giving an 8k resolution right now humming them more or does it help them to actually get their name up there what did you think? I mean, <laughs> no, but let, let, I think a better way to talk about this is to, I'll talk you through my process and why we, why I've shot with Sony for video for years right. now and why, which is weird because like, okay, to start with, I've used the Canon ecosystem for a long time. So I have right. like a whole plethora of lenses, like all of like 51.4, you know, I have the, uh, 
uh, you know, 85, 14. We have, we have everything, like all the L series lenses. And when I was using that for my photography, I would like, it was great, right? And I liked it. But as I made the switch over to, for my commercial work, I switched to a Hasselblad system for my hotel photography. So mm -hmm. then I was thinking, we started growing into doing more video production. As I was doing video production, I started to work with like real editors and cinematographers. Like I worked with this one guy from New Zealand and he's out of Berlin and he knows video a lot better than I do. So we talked about systems and what we could use and what, you know, what we should use and what we shouldn't use. And I thought, well, in the beginning we used the 5D Mark three for video and mm -hmm. you know he was like listen the output the things that i'm not getting all the bit rate and all stuff wasn't as good as the a7s2 so we had basically he was like listen for this system because we're doing mostly almost all of our stuff we're shooting on a ronin you know some of it we're putting on a tripod but he's like we're gonna the way we're gonna use it so that's how i'll talk about it is we're gonna run that we're not gonna use the files inside we're gonna run it through an atmos so we have atmos ninja that we're okay. gonna run it through. he's like that was the best camera at the time so when we bought the a7s too, we bought it years ago and he just loved all the functionality of it loved that he could do everything was very video forward like i didn't buy the a7s2 to use for uh, photography at all we've like mm -hmm. never used it it probably has taken like 10 pictures with it that's right. it so right. we bought two of those we used for video and and i just really liked it he liked it he's the one editing the files he's the one you know working with the files later on and doing working with the graders for our you know we're doing professional work so right. it was the right system for us coupled with the atmos system and coupled with the ronin because small enough to take around affordable at the time because we have to buy two if something goes wrong we have to have two because we are producing these large shoots with models at luxury hotels in exotic places so it's a lot on the line so we're taking two cameras and he liked the S-Log system in the beginning. Now, I do think in what I've heard, and I haven't used it, and I have no firsthand experience, that people are liking the, what, the R6 now, mm -hmm. or the R5, is the R5 and R6, right? The R5 is yeah, the more expensive yeah, one. Yeah, that's right. Um, I've read a lot of good things about that, but my, my team, it's funny, right? Because we're doing all these professional shoots, like 4K was nice, but not for how you think. 4K people, oh, well, like, we need it because everyone's gonna output on 4K, but really, even still, no one, most of our clients don't actually need 4K. What are they doing with our videos? They're doing these big shoots, but they're putting them on the web. They don't really need 4K. <laughs> what we're using 4K for is just more of the latitude. You know, we have more latitude with the files. We can punch in if we need to. We can crop a little bit more, and that's fine. But, like, honestly, there's never been, like, we've never chased that other stuff. We are getting clients now in Vietnam that are like, oh, we need, we need 4K, or it has to be 6K. But, like, I don't even think we're at the point where clients need 4K still, never mind 6K or 8K. So I think it's ridiculously silly that people chase that and get excited about that kind of stuff. Like I'm more into the overall like quality of, mm. of the camera and the price of the camera. Like that's why I said like buying used is great. I think if you're getting into video now, like the A7S III came out and it's packed with features, but if you're not using it like a ton, like we are, like we won't even upgrade to that camera probably till mid next year. Because yep. our A7S twos are fine, and like honestly, if they're fine for what we're doing for like a global hotel brand, like, like yep. Intercontinental, it's probably fine for most people, especially like prosumers. I find it really funny that people get so caught up on these things. I like, think they're going to grow into it, but even if you do grow into it, which I always, you know, I applaud people that grow into more professional work. But at the same time, like, do your clients really need that? You know, like, do they really need six K? <laughs> do you really need eight K? Like. Who even has, I don't watch my TV in 4K, you know, I don't, like, I, I don't know, I, I get the appeal of 4K, like, right now, but you definitely didn't need it three years ago, and you might kind of need it now, but 6K and 8K, like, I don't know, maybe down the line, fine, but I just don't see the, the need for yeah. it. At the time, it's, it's so behind the output, right? Like, yeah. Now, record on that, and then five years from now, but by the time, five years from now, when people all have 6K TVs, they'll have cameras that shoot in 12K or whatever, so... <laughs> I don't know. So for me, the Sony system was just from the beginning. And I think that's a huge, huge advantage for any company. If they got it right early, then you switch to that system. So we use what's funny because we have so many of the, so much Canon glass and it didn't want to sell it all and change it out. So we use both Sony A7S twos with Canon adapters, yeah. uh, with uh, um, uh, Metabones adapters, and it works yeah. fine. And we're not using for our stuff. We're not using autofocus. So it doesn't matter as much. Uh, yeah. Okay. Does that make sense? Like, so, because we're doing everything on the Atmos, we're doing everything with, with manual focus and we've got that bigger screen so we can, we can uh, focus yeah. everything there. At some point, maybe, because Sony does have a pretty awesome autofocus system, which I've just been introduced to with the A6600 for vlogging. It's like, it's so cool. I don't, I don't know what Canon's at with autofocus with so the R5 and R6, but it does seem like it's packed with features. It seems like it's probably caught up a little bit, but it might be one of those things where it's like, yeah, but like it's a long time, right? Between like where they caught up to Sony on the video. Yeah. You you'll be surprised. I, I can tell you 
right from the start right now, the the R5 R6 has has the same AF performance as the Sony, or even better, and that's how yeah. it. So, uh, if you if if I have the money right now and I need just need something for video vlogging, I would maybe probably would just go with the Sony. Yeah. And if I want to actually lower down my budget even further, I may even go down all the way to the Z, the ZV1 uh, compact cam. Yeah. Which is fantastic for, for home studio like mine, which I don't have much space for big big cameras and sure. all those things. Yeah. So, um, my feel about the Canon R's right now is that, yes, they are overselling on the 8K and the technical po- the technical problems when associated with the R5 with the 8K with the heat problem is actually bringing them down. Yeah. The cold quality of uh, the Canons right now are good. As a still photographer, I will say it's fantastic. But if I'm going to do some videos on the side uh, where or you have a professional uh, team to actually do videos, I will guess the A7S will do a better job. And that comes to this question about why would why would a company like Canon wants to squeeze everything into one package um, when um, perhaps a camera that does who is which is not a jack of all trades does a better job. That's I think that's the reason why you get the A7S because it's meant to be a video cam in the first place. Uh, yeah. and, and the R5, R6 is like, it's going to be jack of all trades, but uh, seems like they have some problems with the heat issues. And that is a problem. <laughs> and, and it's an expensive problem. The, 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 R, the R5 is costs about 4,000 US dollars. Hmm. Mind blown. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think, like, for me, I would look, I don't know enough about the R5, but what I've done, the little research I've done when I was just looking into, you know, my vlog camera setup, what I was going to do, like, I wanted to go into Canon because I have all the Canon lenses, so I was actually leaning towards going with an R5, but when I thought more deeply about it, I was honest with myself, like, I kind of talked about my, my my episode about how to pick your camera, I was like, what features do I need, what else is important to me, is size important to me, and yes, it is, because I bought the Leica system because it's small, and I like the minimalistic feel to it. And I like that about it. But I decided that when I'm going to do these great stories, these interesting stories, I'm going to dedicate a day. Like I'm, I was photographing the last Northern White Rhinos and that was a fascinating story. And I really missed an opportunity to do some vlog style stuff and some B-roll. So for me, I thought, okay, this would be great now for my personal project to build the documentary along the way. So individual episodes, but I want a smaller kit. I don't need all the features. I have all the, I'm different, right? But I, you have to know what you're different and how you're different and what you need and what you don't need. So when the reason I went with the A6600 was I thought, listen, I can get really great 4K footage if I need it, but really most of the stuff I'm going to do is probably going to be 120p in HD. It has a flip-up screen so I can look at myself. I can attach uh, uh, Atmos V to it if I want a little bit better of a file, if I'm going to do something that I think has potential to be a bigger documentary. But it was really right. just size, size and price for me. Because this camera here, what was it, about $1,200 US dollars, and then I bought the Sigma 16 1.4, Great Correct. autofocus, but look at the size of that. It's a 16, it's tiny, like, look, smaller <laughs> than my hand, you know? And I just thought, okay, this is something I'm likely to take with me. This is, I'm not, if I take a whole other Canon R5 and then all the lenses with it, forget it. Then I've totally defeated the purpose of having the Leica, you know, or it's just way more gear to carry with me. This was like one camera, one lens, maybe I'll get a 30 to go with it to have that two option, but another tiny setup that matches well because exactly what I'm trying to do with my stills, I want to do with my video as well. Something portable, something high quality. And realistically, I'm going to use it on YouTube. And this is even overkill. If I'm being honest with myself, this is even overkill for YouTube because like, yeah. I don't need 4K. I probably don't need to run it through the Atmos unless I just want that bigger screen and want to see it. But everything about this was like, uh, it just had the things that mattered to me. Size, video quality was really great. People yeah. seemed to love it. The autofocus system was great. And it was a nice price. So that's kind of how I chose. I do think a camera like the R5, like if you were a, if you were a very professional photographer, like you might really need it. You're doing like high quality assignments or you're doing like, you know, you're doing weddings and you make a lot of money off of that. And you, you just want to build the system where you guys can swap out. And like, you know, if you were a full video, a full wedding production company doing photography and video, it, I could see it being of use there because you could kind of swap everything out and you really like the Canon ecosystem. But yeah, it's a very expensive still camera that shoots video really well, but how many people really need to do video really well, you know, if you're being honest with yourself? 
Yeah, uh, yeah. That's that's the thing. It's right now. It's to me. It's Canon. It's pandering to those people who wants a camera, a good stills for the stills camera that can actually do video as well. But but like you say, jack of all trades is master of none. So they can't do a proper job. And I do not want a camera that is like shooting halfway through and then it hits up and then it's just stop working completely. It doesn't make sense at all. So. Yeah. But that's only been, from what I understand, that's only been a problem when you're shooting what, like 8K or 6K, right? No, um, okay, for the, I just to be fair, to be honest as well, I tried it on the R6 and yeah. I was actually just shooting 4K 30. Okay, and I was doing intervals of 10 minutes um, video clips uh -huh. with, uh, with no breaks in between, but 10 minutes clips, stop it for a while, start recording again by the third sec, third interval, the 27th minute, it just stops working because it, just yeah. take overheat. It was like, no, that doesn't work because sometimes I do need to take 10 minutes of certain things uh, as, as it goes on or even five or f four minutes. And then yeah. I don't want to point when it point at the time where by, when I'm shooting close to half an hour, it just stops working. It, yeah, it sure. That's so a shame. Yeah, that is a pain. So I, I, I'm just saying that Canon is trying too hard sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> They're trying too hard sometimes where to, to push everything out there and then you get a tool that is not no, it's, it's, it's a pain. They have a good tool if they can solve the heating issues or they should have just like, okay, let's not look into um, over producing a camera that can do 8K. Perhaps we just do a very good 4K and 120 frames per second and make sure the heat doesn't affect anybody and people yeah. can use it as, as planned. I think that's what manufacturers should, should do. And and, yeah. and just look at it this way from a very practical, pragmatic point of view. And then people can, is willing to say, okay, because this camera works, I'm willing to pay 4,000 plus, uh, uh, 4,000 plus Singapore dollars, Singapore dollars, okay. not US dollars, for something that it can work all the way. And with me, with no worries, and people can just say, uh, take my money. You know, that kind of, that kind of thing. Yeah, so it's, like, it's, it's, it. it's like a, it's a feature arms race that's happening with these camera companies. And I yeah. think sort of, not like, but to be honest, like I think a lot of, I think sort of uneducated consumers are driving uneducated decisions by the camera companies because people think they need 8K, so they're cramming it in. Maybe, you know, different companies, brands are cramming it in because everyone thinks they need it, but you don't need it. But it's like, yeah. but then like the reviewers out there, the big time reviewers who are using these cameras for like maybe just a weekend or a couple of days, they're yeah. like saying, oh, they're mad because like, why buy this one? Because this one has 6K and this one has 8K. When yeah. really... Like ninety nine percent of people don't even need six K or eight K. Like yeah. so, it, it's it's funny. It's like it's yeah, and and I think a lot of camera systems. It's frustrating as a professional because I think a lot of times like they're not really built. Most of these cameras like aren't really built with a professional in mind. I think that's oh, what Sony so. did well with their video camera yeah. because they listen to actual professionals that care about bit rate and care about running their camera. You know what can it run through through uh, Atmos. What kind of files can I get? What kind of latitude can I get out of it? I yeah, think right. that's what they did really well with the A7S II. And that's why it's like still a great camera. So like even people like that are thinking, oh, I'm going to buy the A7S III. Like honestly, the A7S II used is probably a great price right now. I don't know offhand, but probably a great price and probably is more than, has more features than you could possibly need compared to the A7S III at a great price. Agree. Agree. I I, I, I have to agree with you. So right now it's like the manufacturers are, um, in, when, when DSLRs, sales are plunging and they have that kind of pressure to get the sales uh, yeah. out of the gate, I think that is not the way. The, the, the tool must be the one that convinces the user to actually buy into the system. Right now, it's, like, it's not the features, it's actually how pragmatic, how practical the camera is. Now, now yeah. it's impractical for this. I, I, I just, I just like quite frustrated. It's like me right now, I'm actually a consumer looking into mirrorless system and trying to get a system, but all the vibes are wrong. All the vibes are yeah. totally, totally wrong. But that's what drew me to the Leica system is they, they like, they're so particular. They've got a camera that just shoots black and white. They've got a camera without a screen. They've got like very simple cameras. Like I know it's expensive, but like, honestly, like I dig their branding of that. Cause I do think it makes sense for certain people. Like I don't care that my Leica doesn't shoot video. My Leica M10 does. I would never use that feature. And they didn't put anything sexy into right. that feature because right. They don't need it, and the M10D, I'm never like it doesn't make any sense. So that's great. It just has has aperture priority, which I don't use. Shutter priority, fancy features. It turns on and off and has a Wi-Fi connection. Right, I, right, I, right. My aperture and shutter speed nice, and that's all I need. That, but that works for me within that camera. It, there's so many. I think the problem is that these camera companies, like I said, this arm race, and then there's so many people that think they need 
every bit. And they really aren't honest with themselves when they go and buy a camera. That's why people don't buy used as much as they should because they think they need 50 megapixels. Listen, my stories are published, they're printed huge. I sell gigantic prints. I sell it through a gallery, like limited edition prints. And I'm using a Leica M10D with a 24 megapixel sensor. It's fun. Oh, it's great. Right. People love it. 24. Yeah, and how many people like out there are actually printing their images? That, that's the thing. That's the thing. Uh, that's like a lot of people was like saying, "Oh, well, so you just need like the forty-five megapixel, the fifty megapixel, so fantastic and blah blah blah." I was like, "Do you print? I actually print off. Can you believe it? I actually print off with this." Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Again, I print it with an iPhone and it's been fine. Like I, yeah. I, I really don't think like chasing the, the. And then when I do buy a camera with bigger, you know, megapixels or or a bigger sensor like the Hasselblad X1D, it's because my clients will actually use that. Like they are printing billboards with it. They're printing giant posters and right. we're doing a lot of retouching on those images. So it makes sense, but I wouldn't need to, like you like most people don't need that camera system either or medium format. Like it's, right. unless you're really doing it, unless you're really honest with yourself, it's also a problem. Like your pros and your amateurs are both guilty of the same thing when they're not getting the kind of likes or the kind of like likes or the attention that your amateur wants or the professional, which would be work and, and you know, getting more jobs. The first thing they're going to do is not blame themselves. They're going to blame the camera or the system they have. And really, if you're truly honest with yourself, it's not that it's always you. Yeah. <laughs> you know? uh, I try to be humble too. <laughs> <laughs> but it is like, it's you like, honestly, like I can go out and shoot with this $1,200 camera and get nice, results with it i can go out and shoot with a 500 dollars camera of course if i can afford to and the features allow me to and it makes sense for me fine but when you start blaming the outside world or you i mean you start blaming your camera and your system then you know you're just you're just lying to yourself really i i i just saw something this couple of days um all the nikon z users right now are showing off all their 7200 f 2.8 lenses right now i i actually understand their joy but I just felt that why don't you just show photos of the lenses that you shoot you just bought with I think that actually speaks more volume than just showing off photos of the camera gear that you just bought <laughs> you know what is that it's like show yeah. off the images that comes from the lens that actually makes more sense than you showing me a photo of the lens on the camera yeah. It's like uh, it, it's like the before and after picture where people lose a bunch of weight. The before picture is always taken in a really bad light, right? Yeah. And things are never measured in real form. So before and after picture is always like really bad light, and then the after picture is beautiful side light, so you look really cut and you're tanned and you're oiled up. It's like no, I want to see things compare. You know, apples to apples <laughs> and oranges to oranges. Make it simple. It's the same with lenses. Yeah. If you're really gonna look in cameras, look at a look at a raw file of two cameras that were shot without any adjustments made in camera post-production. That's how you really know because oh. I'll see people like, Oh, I love the color that comes out of your Leica. I'm like, well, that's my, it's, that's less the camera. And sometimes it's more yeah. the way of owning it. Like really it's not, but the, the overall look and sharpness. Yes. That could be the lens, you know? True. True. I, I, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm saying the focus, uh, part of the pun, it's actually all over the place. And it's actually at the wrong place these days. It's like when I look at people, I actually want to say share photos. Then you learn. Share yeah. photos. Don't keep talking about the gear. Share the photos. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think more people than not like to talk about their gear rather than use their gear. <laughs> that's, that's the thing. It's like, I'm sorry to say too, but um, you're, you're, of, you and David, both of you guys are like our guys. So I kind of understand if you're a user and, and, and you're proud to be a user because you actually get great images of it. But there are some people uh, from a certain nationality that will just hang a Leica down there sure. and then struts around and just hang the Leica down there and well, shoot like a Leica. Yeah. Well, you're, you're right. That's more their brand. Like, honestly, that's a way bigger, that's a way bigger consumer market than who I am, which is like <laughs> buying it and actually using it for real work. That's going to be published. Like that's a bigger market. So I don't really blame them for pandering to them, but it, it is funny. Like I joked in my thing and someone made a comment about it. Like, you know, that when you go to a Leica shop, they're handling it with white gloves and everything. I'm like, I, why? I am going to beat the crap out of this camera. Like, I don't need white gloves. I'm going to buy it. You can hand it to me. We can scratch it right now if we want, because I am going to, you know, really get into this camera. It's not going to be displayed in some box just for people to look at. It's going to be yeah. in my hands most of the yeah. time. I, I, I feel that that is the problem right now. When you buy new gear, you, you just 
treat it like a baby when it's not yeah. supposed to be in the first place, like the Canon 1D, they are basically workhorses. Get out there and shoot, you know? Yeah. Uh, I don't understand. So, but, but let's talk about megapixels right now. Sure. Uh, in your line of work, do you think 50 megapixels is actually good enough for, for billboards? That's number one question. And when you look into the media format, have you tried the Fuji GFX and what do you think about it? Um, and what makes you feel that the Hasselblad is actually doing a better job over the GFX, uh, for example? Or yeah, even- I, I, I'm not like a huge, like just, just to let you know, so I made a, I made a purchase, I made an upgrade to uh, medium format for my hotel and resort work because right. it's, it's, it's a big portion of my income. It's a large portion and we have a really big client, so it makes sense. A consistent pipeline of work, all these resorts and hotels. And it's the kind of camera that I, I mean, those kind of shoots, I can really slow down. We can really think, you know, there's not like, I'm not shooting editorial style. I don't need fast at all focus. So Hasselblad X1D, I'm actually just editing right now a review I have about it two years later. The autofocus sucks on it. It's not great. They had a ton of bugs in the beginning because it was the first generation of a camera. Right. You know, it, it, nothing that couldn't be fixed. Like I, I never couldn't use it on a shoot. So I want to make that clear, but I would, everything could be fixed by taking the battery out and putting it back in again, which isn't fun on a professional shoot to be stressed like that, but it did have a lot of bugs. A lot of them have been fixed, but I was less concerned about like, I know it's the same sensor as the Fuji at the time, whatever that Fuji medium, but, but it was just like, I'm going to use this camera like a lot. Like I go on shoots that last three weeks at a time. I like the way it feels in my hand. I like the metal on it. I, I've already told you, you know, why I use like, I like the aesthetic. So that was important to me. The natural color that came out of the Hasselblad, I really liked too. Uh, the, the actually menu system, was mm-hmm. really nice like all these little things are important to me i don't think they're that important if you're if you're showcasing the camera but if you're using it like seven hours a day or 12 hours a day i just like that like the, the fonts and the menu system is just easy you tap on it i can adjust things very quickly very minimalistic very simple aesthetic matters to me so yeah i i love that system it's very expensive it's come down on price a bit the lenses are expensive but i'm very happy with it we do some billboards with it um but and they're they're great but really like even giant posters and things like that the sharpness, the details are amazing. My retoucher, when we do, my retoucher, because I was using the 5D SR, which was what, a 50, was it 40 megapixels or 50 megapixels? 50. 50. Yeah, yeah, but a full but a full frame, not yeah, yeah. format. And my retoucher, the first thing that she noticed was just like, wow, can we just use the Hasselblad from now on? Like immediately, two retouchers that I work with both said the same thing. Like, can we just use that for all the files because they're great to work with. I'm not seeing any corruption when I'm messing around with them. Because some shoots, we're not doing a ton of retouching, but some we are. We're changing, we're removing scaffolding on a construction mm-hmm. site, or we're changing the sky out. And she was just like, yeah, the files are amazing on this. I can push it if we, if we needed to bring up the midtones, or, and, uh, or just pushing the file, the dynamic range, and it was great. So I know you'll get a similar, uh, the same exact sort of files, at least the, the uh, you know, at least, the, at least the leeway you'll get with moving the files around the dynamic range on the Fuji, because it is the same sensor. But... I just like the Hasselblad system. I like the aesthetic of it. And it just felt great in my hand. And for me, that was enough. I wasn't, I'm not the kind of person that's going to like compare things back and forth like a ton. It was a, it was cheaper for the Fuji. The Fuji did have more lenses probably at the time, but the Hasselblad system luckily has grown. And I think the X1D Mark II probably has fixed a lot of the things that, that were wrong with the, with the first one. But for me, not a lot of major complaints about the first one. And I've used it for two years on professional assignments. It's just slow. But like, I wouldn't use it for travel stuff. Like I, I just wouldn't, I've, I've used it for a personal project because I'm gonna print and I, it's a kind of project where I'm slowing down and looking for more like landscape type shots and these beautiful epic shots that I'm gonna print really, really big. But if I had to focus quickly to do street photography with it, absolutely not, it'd be horrible for that. Mm, true, <laughs> I, of, co- of course, there it comes to the point of getting the right tools for the right job. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's the thing, I, I, I guess a lot of people who actually want to buy stuff and talk about stuff is that are you buying the right thing for the right thing for the right stuff you need to do? Right. Like I didn't need a Hasselblad to have, you know, a 1080p and 4k in there. It just didn't need it to shoot video, but I would never use it. Yeah. Like, and that, and that was great of them. They didn't really, they, they threw video in there, but really that was just like basic video and it didn't mess with anything else. Yeah. Like, it, it, but it's, that's their audience. That, that, that's it. Like, I think for me that worked and that's a new, I think the Hasselblad system is great for someone that, which is a rare breed, people that shoot like luxury hotels and there's not a ton of them. It's not a big market, market but yeah. I think it would also be a great camera for people that 
are doing like really epic landscape shots and selling them as prints in a gallery. I think it'd also work well for people that do yeah, that. But, but it will be the Ansel Adams and you're going to bring that big <laughs> thin type, glass type or, or full. Yeah, but that's real the nice thing. Frame, like, real frame. Frame. It's so tiny in your hand. I really like it. Like you just grab it with one hand and, and it just feels great, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I, 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 it still goes back to the point about you have to be you have to understand yourself as a photographer to actually understand what you need to buy. Yeah. And, and I feel that the last two decades, I would say the last two decades since digital photography come along, a lot of people have been led by specification lists rather than, sure. yeah. who am I as a photographer? I, 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 I have to talk about this because... I'm a reviewer. Sometimes when people look at my reviews and say, well, why are you talking about? Isn't this better for the, 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 so I have to say that, yeah, I have to, I have, I have to review it from a point of view as a photographer who is a travel photographer as well, who also do social, con social media content, who also do video, who also do professional yeah. shoots as well. I have to think about it from that sense and, and try to be fair. That's the thing. I, yeah. The thing is, how do you, how do you get yourself un how do you make yourself understand the camera system? <laughs> that's 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 a question that I have from a lot of people sometimes. It's like, so how do I actually understand the camera system? Why and it actually perturbs me that people keep upgrading their cameras when they don't when they don't maximize the cameras that have in their hands right now. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, it's a big point. People aren't catching up to the qualities in their camera. They're, they're upgrading before they're actually using the features that they paid all the money for the last generation for. Yeah, that's the thing. It's, it's, well, it's really because, I, you know, I think it's different. If you're really a true photographer and you really care about the craft, you spend a lot more time on the craft and a lot less time talking about the gear. It's important to look at reviews and understand the camera and actually see what's on. Like, I, I look at reviews, but I look at it in the context of how I'm going to use it. Like, if I see a person take out a camera and unbox it and they're looking at the features, I'm also going to, I need to understand what that person does, right? That's important for me. So yeah. if I know that person doesn't shoot hotels or they don't shoot professional images in a commercial capacity or mm -hmm. photojournalist, I'm weighing that into my decisions. I'm blocking out what they think about certain things and I'm going to focus on like, okay, it felt great in the hand. Okay, then maybe I can understand that. Or it just has these features, then I, I, I understand. Mm -hmm. Or it's overheated, that can relate to me. So I compartmentalize when I look at reviews what I'm going to take from that reviewer. Cause like, yeah, I'm not always just looking at fellow professionals. I'm sometimes looking at people that review that just looking at like specs and I, but I compartmentalize what I'm going to absorb from them and what I don't care what they have to say, to be honest, you know, and I hope yeah. people do that with me as well. Cause I try to, when I review stuff, I look at gear that I'm using and I try to relate it to like, this would make sense for an amateur or this wouldn't like the Hasselblad X1D. I'm honest. Like when I, I'm just editing my review now, like it isn't for most people. It's not great for travel photography, let's be honest, unless you're going to slow down and do landscape shots and print them, you know, or you're doing like sunset, sunrise shots, cool. But if you're photographing portraits, that's great too. But if you're just doing like travel stuff or street photography, it's not awesome for that, you know? No, it's not. Yeah. So, so that's the thing. I, I'm, I just, my last word for, for this video is like, yeah. before you even think about gears, perhaps look at what you have right now and then maximize it and if you do not know if you have maximized it the best way is to show off your photos yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> I, I i i can't emphasize that enough a lot of people are just shooting and then keep it to themselves and then they keep thinking they are not doing great but the thing is the only way for you to do great is to share it and then ask for opinions how it looks like and how to improve it yeah. and then we come to a point when I, I personally see it's like some, some people keep sharing and the photos get better, the images get better. And then I realized that the tool is essentially hindering them from further growth. I'll tell them to upgrade. Yeah. Immediately. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But unfortunately, there's a lot of people is like, I'm going to buy this because of this megapixel. It has this fair AF. It's fantastic. I said, okay, stop there. Stop there. Okay, agree. The AF is great. But but are you using it? Like, are you going to shoot sports right. with it? Yeah. You're not? Then why are you so... Yeah. Yeah, I cool. laugh at it. I laugh at that all the time when it was just pure, when it was just pure like photography cameras before they started having those hybrids and people like, Oh, it only shoots like six frames a second. I'm like, what are you shooting? Why do you need 11 frames a second? Do you really need it? Are you shooting like pro tennis events? Are you going to like the US Open? But like, no. So don't worry about it. It's fine. It's fine for me. It should be fine for you. It's the same with video specs. I'm like, 
Do you actually need that? If more people are honest with themselves, and if you put half the time and half the energy into like actually getting better at photography, that'll or like or, or like just the time, right? Take your time. If you all the time that you're looking at gear, all the time you're thinking of these things. If you just put that into going out and shooting, you'll get better. Or just say you're going to upgrade to a new camera that was $3,000, but your camera has all the specs you actually need. Take that $3,000, go on a trip to Africa, and go on the trip of your life and photograph wildlife. You know what I mean? Because that will make you 100 times better photographer than a $3,000. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Take that money, travel, see the world, yeah. shoot the world, and the photos that comes out of it, people will ask you, wow, that's a very nice photo. Yeah. That's the next I question. Get it. Yeah. What gear did you use? <laughs> right. I know. It's the biggest insult that a photographer gets all the time. Like, I get it all the time with the house of God. Like, wow, that camera must take nice pictures. I'm like, no, I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's part of it. I'm the one who shoot it. I use a freaking phone yeah. to shoot it. And people ask you, it can't be a phone. It cannot be a phone. I say, it is the phone. You want yeah. me to see your exit files? It's oh, that's, a beautiful, that's a beautiful house. You must have a good saw. Like, no, I <laughs> have a good builder. I have a good architect. <laughs> oh, it's, it's the same. Oh, this wood is delicious. So which pens and pots did you use? <laughs> I mean, I get the fun of it. And I'm guilty of that too. It is fun to look at cameras. It is right. fun to like check things right. out. But I'm just very, that, that's what I would leave people with. Like for me, I'm very honest <clears throat> about what I need and what I don't need. And yes. if I need to upgrade, I don't. And if I, you know, I've, I've, I've paid more for less. That's what I like is I paid a lot more money for something less and more dialed down. So that, that speaks volumes about, you know, how much you need features and how much you need all these little extra right. gadgets in your camera and stuff like True. that. So True. I look at it, I'm honest with myself. Am I going to use the video functions that this camera has? Is there a need to upgrade? For most people, the answer is probably no. Mm. <laughs> so we're going to end this soon. It's, going to, it's been an hour okay. plus. So how's Hanoi right now? Everything's good here. You know, we're, we're low cases for a country with almost 100 million people. We barely have any cases. We've been free for a long time. People follow the rules quite, um, quite strictly. So that's been nice compared to my home country of the United States. So it's been, <laughs> it's been a pleasure to live oh here. And I feel honored and I feel happy with the way that oh, everyone's handled it. The people in the government. So it's been good. Uh. I, I, I have to I have to try to empathize what Americans are thinking right now when it comes to Trump <laughs> and, and the administration. Oh my god. Oh my god. So uh, hopefully I can see you guys back again. I'm gonna stop recording soon so we okay. can check out a bit more. And uh I wonder David, since you're here, we got anything you want to say? <laughs> David, uh, sorry, oh, just, oh sorry. I'm just, uh, enjoying the conversation that's going on. Uh, I have to say that I agree with you guys about the the choice of camera must fit the the usage, your 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 use case scenarios, and also uh, it must fit the vision that you're trying to show. So the pictures are the most important, and then you choose a gear to bring out that vision in you rather than the the other way. So you don't choose the cameras based on specs, but you choose based on which one, which camera, and which piece of equipment will allow you to bring forth your vision in the best. In the, in the best and easiest possible way. Yeah. Hmm. So that's a good tip. Yeah. Well, good, good. I think pe and people should judge it in the, when they're looking at reviews, judge it in the context of the person that's using it because we're all different. The way I'm going to use a camera is a lot different than even other pros are going to use a camera. We're all so different. So it's good to listen to people and check out their reviews, but review it in the context of be honest with yourself and how you're different than that photographer. You know, yeah. for the, the Leica M10D, like it's just not going to make sense for a lot of people. They're not doing following people around for 10 days and having the luxury and time to be patient, think like that. So that doesn't make sense for a lot of people, but it makes sense for me. Yeah, yeah. And, and also I, I want to say that uh, there's a lot of resources out there on the web. The reviewers, uh, I mean the channels, that we, the, the reviews that Winston is putting out and uh, all the other reviewers are putting out. So I think what we, I mean the, the material is out there. I think we, uh, as, as photographers, as creators, we need to make, make the best use of, uh, of, the, of the medium. So like, for example, you mentioned that the way you use a camera will be very different from another, from someone else. So I totally agree with you, which is why I actually, actually follow your channel. Uh, because you are a Leica user, because you use M10D. Uh, I, I, I use, uh, I use uh, the M as well for, for a number of years, yeah. So, uh, I mean, that is one of the reasons why I ended up following your channel. And also because of your review uh, of the unit that was loaned by Leica Singapore. Um, but I do follow other channels, yeah. So, I mean, that's one aspect, but I also do follow, uh, like, for example, Wilson's uh, reviews of the, the Canon system, all the other cameras, purely from a interest, uh, from like a interest point of view of yeah. what technology is there is. And also when I set up my webcam, 
because I'm not a video guy at all, right? So I, I so when I set up this uh, Sony, this very old Sony system that I have, this this camera that I'm using right now is uh, it's a seven year old uh, camera. I, it was the original A7 when it first came out in two hundred one three. That is a good camera. Yeah, I wanted to use it for my with my M lenses at that time, but it the result wasn't very good. So, yeah, very good. oh yeah, but 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 uh, I still have it. And seven years later, I took it out. I I mean I I do use it once in a while, but seven years later, now it's a full time webcam for me in these COVID times, and so I had to learn from blogs like uh, Wilson's uh, blogs and various no technical blogs on how to set up the camera for video, how to how to do the HDMI into the to the to, to my computer. So yeah, so what I want to say is that the resources the resources are out there for us to learn various things, and I think learning is it's always a good thing to learn. Which is why even though I shoot the M system mostly. I do know we are on other systems here, yeah, but I think at the right time, at the right place, we will use the, the materials to, to, for us to, to achieve what we want. And then that's the whole point of uh, the ecosystem on, online, where every, everyone is sharing information and we just need to know how to pick the best one that fits us. Yeah, yeah to follow the advice that suits us, yeah. Yeah, and then commit to it and be okay with it, you know, and, and, and just get better at that rather than thinking another camera is going to make you better or get better at your photography. That's the, that's the key. Yeah. All right. Uh, may I suggest you go and upgrade the lens to a wider one so that <laughs> <laughs> I won't see your pimples or whatever. <laughs> it's too sharp, right? It's too sharp. Yeah. Yeah. Twenty. <laughs> 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 okay. This does too short. That's the reason why Justin bought a sixteen. So you see, we had to buy gears for a specific solution to certain things, like Justin bought. Justin bought a 10 16. Is it a 16 30? Well, I bought a 16, which what on APC is like a 24. So it's perfect yeah. for vlogging because it's not it's not super wide, which would be a little bit better, but it's not too tight either. That's right, that's right. So so that and that works with his uh, A7S as well. So he's actually buying one lens but for multiple users. You see, that's the thing, that's what we want. We want just want to save money, but we also want to support com companies that help us to save money. That's that's yeah. the end of it all and, and makes makes our life and our work so much easier, right? So thank you very much, guys. You can stick around and chit-chat some more while I'll stop recording. All right. Thank you, everybody, for coming, especially Jimmy, you know, um, yeah, uh, for actually chit-chatting on... on, on, uh, on yeah, chat. thank you, Jimmy, for adding all these. And, and thank you, thank you, David, for the for being on live with us as well. Yeah. Thank you, Jason, for putting this all together. Yeah, yeah. So we'll, we'll try to do this again when uh, closer to Christmas, you know, why? And then well, say, what are the new What are the new stuff we can buy for our friend or for our sure, sure. ones who are photographer buffs? Yeah, that is a huge hint. <laughs> huge <laughs> for Christmas. Okay, see you guys soon. Okay. While I stop recording. Yeah. Right. I gotta run, guys. It's very good to talk to you. Thank you. Yeah, Wilson. man. No, man. Bye. Yeah.